All right. So good morning and good afternoon ARL visitors and our esteemed guest, Dr. Fong, and welcome to today's colloquium, Neurodiversity, Neurodiversity in the Workplace, Part 1. My name is Ha Kim and I am currently serving as the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Employee Advisory Group Co-Chair with Jeffrey Beals, our chair, who's with us today. And before we begin, I just wanted to um, announce a couple of administrative uh, reminders. So uh, the first thing is as more folks start trickling in, just wanted to make a quick note about slides. They are available and they are posted at the top of this chat for today. Uh, and they will be posted again at the end of this event. So please download them at your convenience. Next, uh, just as a reminder, the event is being recorded. Uh, so if you do not wish to be recorded, please exit the event and wait for the recordings to be available on Teams or mute uh, your audio and your video um, during that time. Lastly, just in terms of the format, the event will be about 45 minutes for presentation and 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, I'll be monitoring the chats uh, for any questions and uh, Mark will also be helping out with uh, the, the participations. Um, so feel free to use the hand feature during the Q&A session for the participations and we'll try to uh, make sure that uh, first come first serve. And last but not least, uh, just a note about bandwidth. Uh, in order to save on bandwidth, I will be turning off my video after the introduction. Others are encouraged to do the same. Uh, so when it is time for questions, I'll be turning my video back on and uh, just the same guidance for all others as well. Let's begin. So our guest speaker is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University. He specializes in autism as a practicing psychiatrist at Stanford Healthcare and Stanford Medicine Children's Health, and the father of a teenage son on the autism spectrum. He also serves as a director of the Stanford Neurodiversity Project, which strives to uncover the strengths of neurodiverse individuals and utilize their talents to increase innovation and productivity of the society as a whole. He and his research team are currently conducting a study to demonstrate that specialized employment programs, such as a Neurodiversity at Work program, will result in higher retention rates and quality of life and has been collaborating with organizations of all sizes to include, most famously, Google in its launch of their Google Cloud Autism Career Program in July of last year. We are very excited to have him. Please help me welcome Dr. Lawrence Fang. Thank you, Ha, for the very generous and nice introduction. And uh, thank you, Ha and Greg, for the, in for the invitation. Uh, so today, uh, I'm going to be talking about neurodiversity and focusing on the, the workplace. And I will also introduce to you the strength-based model of neurodiversity and uh, what we are doing at the uh, Stanford Neurodiversity Project. What is neurodiversity? First, uh, I'd like to just define it as a concept that regards individuals with differences in their brain function and behavioral traits as part of normal variation of the human population. When we talk about neurodiverse conditions, oftentimes people are thinking about autism, maybe sometimes ADHD, uh, as well as dyslexia, but actually it, sh uh, it is more than uh, only the few conditions. It is a range of conditions from um, communication differences, intellectual developmental disorder, motor uh, disorders, neurogenetic disorders, uh, traumatic brain injury that's more congenital uh, base, especially, and fetal alcohol uh, spectrum disorders and other neurologic conditions, psychiatric conditions. So neurodiverse or neuro um, divergent are somewhat like the opposite of the term neurotypical. So neurotypical, according to Nick Walker, a uh, researcher in the field, um, he defined neurotypical as having a style of neurocognitive functioning that falls within the dominant societal standards of normal. I don't like the term normal because um, I, I think uh, it's really about uh, where people are in the bell-shaped curve st uh, and statistically uh, who is 
kind of in the more average zone. Um, and then neurodiverse versus, versus uh, neurodivergent. Uh, neurodivergent was defined as having a mind that uh, functions in ways which significantly uh, from uh, the dominant societal standards of normal. Again, th this is not uh, what I would uh, prefer. I prefer neurodiverse. Uh, according to Merriam Webster uh, dictionary, neurodiverse would be meaning having, relating to, or constituting a type of brain function that is not neurotypical. And it is also more preferred um, term as uh, because neurodiverse is somewhat more neutral uh, rather than neurodivergent. Uh, it has a connotation of being different. And uh, for uh, the most part, I would really uh, want to um, advocate for having the uh, really working together between neurodiverse and neurotypical as uh, a community. So neurodiversity movement is a social justice movement that seeks civil rights, respect, equality and inclusion for neurodiverse, neurodivergent individuals. A few uh, words about the terminology, um, uh, and we're now focusing on autism in the next few slides, um, because for uh, for a while, autism is really at the center of the neurodiversity movement. So if you're looking at this uh, particular slide, this is showing the results of a study that uh, trying to get uh, the autistic population, the parents, professionals, family and friends of autistic individuals to tell us about what their preference would be, which terms they would endorse. And you can see from the bottom autism, autism spectrum disorder, autism spectrum condition, low functioning autism, low function, high functioning autism and NASPY. The highest uh, endorsed is autism. The second may be SP, but what you can see is that the autistic population, even uh, the highest one is only 65% or so. So that means there, uh, there is no over, uh, over uh, overwhelming uh, agreement on which term to be used. And in terms of um, the other uh, roles like uh, professionals, a lot of the time, autism spectrum disorder is uh, considered and autism are uh, uh, most preferred. Another important aspect is identity first language versus person first language. So identity first language would be autistic or autistic person. And then has autism, person with autism would be person first language. And you can see very clearly that there is a, um, and also in the middle is on the autism spectrum, kind of somewhere in between the two. So autistic uh, as a term has the highest percentage endorsed together with on the autism spectrum here. And uh, you can see that person first language, this is um, ac actually uh, much lower, although there's still a, a fair number, like a third of the autistic individuals would prefer that, but two thirds also would prefer identity first language. And this is very important because uh, we're talking about their identity and um, the respect to their identity, as you can imagine, anyone's identity is really uh, deep in their own, um, um, in, uh, in, a, in a very deep level. Uh, a person's identity has uh, a lot of meaning to it, so uh, it is important to acknowledge that uh, if someone is um, on the autism spectrum, you would assume that maybe two thirds of the time the, the person will be preferring identity first language. So this is a study in the UK. There's also another study in uh, Australia and there's this um, th distinction between 
their preferences uh, in autistic individuals versus um, offensiveness, in, uh, which is shown in the next slide. So um, the blue bars would represent the most preferred and uh, the green bar will be the least preferred. So if you are, uh, if you put all these bars together and then uh, weigh them and do the calculation, the most preferred is as uh, in Australia would be person on the autism spectrum and then the identity first language and then person first language. And then when you're looking at the offensiveness, you can also predict that person first language is more offensive according to the autistic individuals uh, versus the identity first language and person on the autism spectrum. So basically, uh, if you're talking with uh, Australians who are uh, on the autism spectrum, you're probably going to be uh, safer to assume that um, they would prefer identity first language or person on the autism spectrum. However, it is not like an overwhelming um, percentage um, that uh, it's not like 90% or 80% of people that want to be uh, sticking with these terms. Some people actually still prefer person first language. So uh, this is just something for all of us to, uh, to understand that there is like still a uh, percentage of people, maybe one third of the people that would uh, prefer person first language. So if uh, possible, try to understand what is the preference of the person in general in terms of how they would want um, to use the language related to autism. Why is the understanding of neurodiversity important in the society in general? First of all, the prevalence is very high. Autism used to be a rare condition like 30 years ago, now is one in 44 or 2.3%. Dyslexia is much higher, 13 to 14%. ADHD is five to 7%, per somewhere in between. So if you take all of the neurodiverse conditions together, it definitely would be the largest minority in the world. And when we are thinking about the concept of neurodiversity, we also want to uh, understand how um, human traits are being evaluated. And uh, when for any trait, we think about a bell-shaped curve. Uh, this is a uh, research community here, so you're very familiar with this uh, bell-shaped curve with the middle 68% being the average on the right side will be above average and the left side will be below average. And as an illustration of human trait evaluation like IQ, for example, which is rather not perfect um, assessment. And I'll tell you why I say that is uh, for someone with IQ of 85 to 115, that will be uh, considered to be on the average zone. And then uh, someone with 108, 130 IQ will be pretty smart. Above 145 will be at the genius level and then under 70 will be considered to be having intellectual disability. And I say this is not uh, perfect because it only measures, IQ only measures visual, spatial, verbal, linguistic, logical, mathematical. It doesn't really assess anything else. How Howard Garner at Harvard University has been um, really uh, pushing this theory of multiple intelligences and uh, teach us to use the other domains to assess human ability, such as musical, rhythmic, bodily, kinesthetic or athletic, naturalistic, interpersonal is ability to relate with each other, intrapersonal is the ability to understand self, and existential is the ability to understand your own existence, the universe's existence, etc. So you can imagine that everyone can have a profile um, that can um, be representing all of these domains. 
and we'll call it a multiple intelligence profile. As an illustration for Einstein, uh, who we know as the uh, genius of the genius, his riff, uh, musical rhythmic ability would be uh, almost above average. He played the violin. Visual spatial will be way up here at the genius level. Verbal linguistics, actually not so high. He didn't speak until four years old. Logical, mathematical, above everyone. Naturalistic, average, and intrapersonal and interpersonal. He actually struggled quite a bit. And bodily kinesthetic average. And basically the main point here is that you can see Einstein as the genius of the ingenious is not uh, superior in every single domain that we are looking at it here. He is definitely superior in the uh, fields, um, in the domains that are related to like theoretical physics and, and because of what he has done over the years, he had contributed so much to the society. And we won't be um, talking about his uh, challenges interpersonally or intrapersonally. There are some other individuals in the world that have similar profiles, uh, so to speak. Um, so uh, they all have some traits of autism and some of them actually have the diagnosis of autism. So here's Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein again, and here's Alan Turing, Nikola Tesla, the guy that owned Tesla, Elon Musk, and some mathematician here, Julia uh, Bowman Robeson, so Sophie Germain, Paul Erdos, and here's um, Benjamin Banneker, the first uh, African-American scientist. There's uh, Emmanuel Kant, a philosopher. There's Charles Darwin. There's Barbara McClintock, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in, genet uh, for, in medicine for genetics work that she did. There's Diane Fossey, who taught us everything about gorillas. And this is uh, Temple Grandin, the most famous autistic individuals still living. And uh, she is prominent in animal science. And this is Greta Thunberg, uh, who is the most uh, effective environmental activist. She is on the autism spectrum. And then we have Michelangelo, there's Andy Warhol, who is the father of uh, pop art, and Wesley Kandinsky, P.A. Mondrian, Joseph, uh, Joseph Corral, and there's Stephen Wilshere, uh, who can fly up the sky um, with a helicopter, remember everything um, in the in the city and then draw the entire city in front of tens of thousands of people. Uh, his uh, diagnosis of autism when um, he turned three years old. Uh, and then we have musicians, um, Mozart, Glenn Gold, and we have Car uh, Lewis Carroll who wrote Alice in Wonderland, Hans Christian, um, uh, Hans Christian Anderson who is a poet, uh, Freddy Jelanek, who uh, is um, a Nobel Prize winner in literature, and she is also one of the first uh, patients that were described by uh, Hans Asperger in 1944. And then uh, we have Andy Kaufman, um, uh, Dan Ancroy, Susan Boyle, um, Daryl Hanna, and then um, we have Tim Burton, Jim Henson, Satoshi uh, Tajiri and uh, Satu Satoshi Tajiri is the creator of Pokemon and Mike Burry, an American investor and neurologist. So one thing that you can see is that they are all representing different fields in, um, in different professions. And they are all uh, also have one thing in common uh, is that they are very deeply interested in their um, uh, in the, their topic that they are want to be uh, spending time on and they are very passionate about it and because of their passion and deep interest they really contribute to the society in a very profound fashion. And uh, when we are thinking about autism, um, we can think of autism as like one set of characteristics uh, that can be both streams and challenges at the same time. So I'll tell you what uh, it means. 
So when someone is uh, doing, when someone on the spectrum uh, is doing something over and over again, and uh, you may be saying this is perseveration. However, when the results are good, then you're going to say this is persistence or per, uh, perseverance, not perseveration anymore. People on the autism spectrum, oftentimes they don't have a tendency of seeing big picture first. They tend to be drawn to details. If you are thinking about someone that need to be uh, focusing on the details, like debugging a program, then you want that person to be focusing on the details and you would uh, not want that person to be uh, focusing on the big picture all the time. Because seeing the big picture all the time will not debug, uh, debug the program. Challenges, um, sometimes uh, aut uh, autistic individuals have, maybe they have fewer interests, but at the same time, when they are interested in something, they would just dive in and uh, get into the very depth of the knowledge and that would benefit everyone. Perspective taking or taking someone else's uh, perspective is not their natural tendency. But uh, at the same time, they are very concrete and honest. They have a, a, a different way of interacting with people socially a lot of the time. And at the same time, they are very loyal. You can see that this is one list of characteristics of autism, which can be both strengths and challenges. And what can make it more displayed as strengths would be about the environment. When the environment is supportive, then individuals on the spectrum will be showing their strengths a lot more. Another neurodiverse condition is ADHD, and uh, these people here uh, have ADHD. This is Alexander Bell, uh, Thomas Edison, JFK, Sir Richard Branson, Michael Phelps, Simone Bowles, uh, Lisa Ling, these are in entertainment industry, Emma Watson, Liv Tyler, Howie Mondell, and uh, Justin Timberlake. And all of them are saying uh, one thing is that without their ADHD, they would not be as successful as they are. So again, uh, like autism, ADHD can also be conceptualized as a condition that can display strains and challenges at the same time. Impulsivity will come with rapid decision making. Hyperactivity will come with high energy, difficulty fo focusing on tasks, that they are not interested in will come with hyper focus on tasks that they in, uh, that interest them. Distractibility will come with creativity, and in fact, creativity is the most talked about trait of ADHD that's considered as a strength, together with resilience, multitasking, big picture thinking, and cooling a crisis. With this profile, it looks more like a, a CEO uh, to me or in the army, I don't know, well, maybe uh, a general. And this list of people have um, dyslexia. Uh, it's Jay Leno, Whoopi Goldberg, Sir uh, Richard, uh, no, Sir Jackie uh, Stewart, who is uh, who has won more Formula One races than anyone. There's Dr. Uh, Carol Greider, uh, Nobel Prize winner in medicine for discovering telomerase. And uh, these are two prominent physicians. Uh, one is uh, Stuart Yudovsky, who is the past chairman of the Manager Clinic at Baylor College of Medicine. And this is Toby Cosgrove, the president and CEO of the Cleveland Clinic. And uh, one thing that especially you can see is that dyslexia is really defined by having the difficulty in reading and uh, and knowing that in science and as well as in medicine, you have to do a lot of reading. These individuals basically make their uh, challenges, their strains. Dyslexia, unlike uh, ADHD and autism, can not be having one list of characteristics that can be spun to uh, uh, both 
challenges and strengths. They are actually one uh, discrete list of challenges and strengths. The common challenges that they, they have in dyslexic people are reading, writing, spelling, time awareness, rote memory, and common strengths would be uh, they are good problem solvers, they're very creative, observant, and they interact uh, very well socially. And if we are to remember what it is uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, to remember the streams of um, dyslexic people, it will be the acronym, acronym MIND streams, material reasoning, interconnected reasoning, narrative reasoning, and dynamic reasoning. Why is uh, the understanding of neurodiversity important, especially in the workplace? And one thing is that, uh, as I explained to you, neurodiversity can be a competitive advantage. With uh, all these really prominent uh, people really demonstrating that um, having neurodiverse conditions uh, really can be um, something that they bring with them that can contribute to organizations. On the other hand, one thing that is also very important that we have to acknowledge is that um, there are true challenges that need to be acknowledged that we have to help uh, neurodiverse individuals by making the uh, workplace more neurodiversely friendly. But um, in the, here, the, the next few slides, basically I'm trying to tell you about what are some of the obstacles that we have to overcome. Uh, one thing is about the, uh, the uh, kind of non-academic skills. Uh, some of the daily living skills, uh, these are uh, like free bars that are representing people on the autism spectrum with very high IQ um, or high IQ um, above 114. This is the group between 100 and um, uh, 114, so there's more like average, and then a, li uh, a little bit on the lower uh, part of the uh, average, um, 85 to 99. And you can, what you can see is that um, when you're looking at uh, these uh, bars, the low vinyl, like the yellow, the red, and um, these are like having more of the issues in their daily living skills. So even with high IQ, you're still seeing a substantial per percentage of individuals that are struggling. And then there is also here that um, when we are looking at uh, the question, um, for individuals that have ever worked uh, for pay since high school among uh, young adults with autism spectrum disorder. The, um, the most, the strongest association with the challenge of actually getting a paid job is conversational impairment. People on the spectrum tend to have a different way of uh, communicating socially and sometimes that really get them to uh, lose their job in their or lose their opportunity to get a job. Another thing that's uh, important to to note is um, in the, the next two slides. I'm going to basically tell you about Alan Turing. Alan Turing cracked the enigma in World War Two, as um, I believe most of you would know uh, the Enigma is um, the encryption machine that the Germans use in the in World War II to communicate with each other. And uh, basically, Alan Turing built the computer, the first digital computer to crack the Enigma. And hence, uh, he had contributed a lot to stopping World War II. He is a very distinguished person, as you can imagine. And he went to the best universities to study and got to awarded uh, and uh, was getting very, very good jobs. However, this is only one side of the problem. Uh, I mean, one side of the, uh, his life. He actually struggled quite a bit when he's growing up. Um, he 
struggle with English, he has no friends. Uh, early on, he was bullied at school big time. And um, for the most part, most of the time he works, he worked alone and he was considered as socially awkward. And in 1952 in UK, he was prosecuted for homosexuality. And uh, this is 70 years ago, and um, the world is, has not caught on at that time. And because of uh, him being prosecuted and have uh, the choice of either going to prison or um, uh, have chemical castration, and he chose chemical castration, he eventually had a very uh, deep depression and committed suicide at uh, a relatively young age of 41. And he was not even recognized at that point as um, someone that actually helped stop World War II. He actually didn't get uh, to be knighted uh, until he was he was dead for like how many years? Like 50, 60 years almost in 2013. So basically his, his, uh, his contributions was not recognized for a long time. Um, and a lot of it could be related to um, his uh, way of communicating with people. So um, if he would, or if the uh, environment is more neurodiversely friendly, it will be very different outcome for him. So I'm going to go to this slide and also say that um, the individuals uh, that um, are represented in this slide are the individuals that have intellectual disability. And uh, what I want to mention is that uh, if someone has intellectual disability versus Down syndrome, which has basically over 95, 98% also, also have intellectual disability, and compared to autism, um, this, this group also in, uh, in the overall autism population, there's a uh, 30 to 40 percent intellectual disability. But if you are looking at all of these that all have intellectual disability and uh, compare them with uh, together in terms of uh, their uh, their paid community work, early on you can already see that there is a big difference. With autism, there is a much lower percentage that they were they are going to be getting a job. And uh, this change um, will happen, but it would happen like for many, many years. So you can see that there's a drastic uh, difference for like good 20 years. So this is a really difficult time for uh, the autistic individuals. Many autistic ind individuals are not able to get work. And this is about um, the work in the community, and this is the uh, work about uh, in the facilities. Um, and um, basically, it, it is showing very similar uh, difference. It is not the same trend, uh, but uh, the, the general um, uh, result here, the conclusion is, is that uh, with autism, there is a much uh, lower chance to get paid work. Another thing that's important for us to note is uh, why neurodiversity is important in the workplace is neurodiverse colleagues are already among this, uh, even in the medical community. And most likely we would say in the, um, in the military, there is also uh, a lot of talk about maybe neurodiverse individuals are already among the military community. And it is important to know that uh, there is a concept about camouflaging. Camouflaging is coping strategies for use in social interactions, uh, such as hiding behaviors associated with autism, like uh, the, uh, 
like someone would need to self-stimulate and will be able to hide the behaviors because it's not socially appropriate. Uh, using explicit techniques to appear socially competent, like uh, memorizing scripts uh, that can be used in social settings, and also finding ways to prevent others from seeing their social difficulties, like not showing up to social events. And what are the motivations of camouflaging? First of all, assimilation. Basically, the, uh, they want to be known and they want to know they want to be uh, part of the community. That's why they want they want to belong, and that's why they uh, they uh, they believe that they need to camouflage. The consequence for that is sometimes people have a stereotype view of what autism looks like, and then uh, even though that sometimes they other people will know that they are uh, on the spectrum, they the uh, other people would still say, oh, you don't really look autistic to me. Uh, when in fact, it takes a lot of energy for autistic individuals to camouflage. And deep down inside, they, they say to themselves, I'm not my true self. And this really create burnout. And what we can see is that camouflaging is directly proportional to depression and anxiety. And this uh, phenomenon of uh, camouflaging is also much higher in females compared to males. This is a study that um, is completed in my lab, and uh, this is another study that's uh, completed in um, Cambridge. And um, the blue curve here is representing males, and the top curve is autistic, and the bottom curve is not an autistic sample. And the uh, differences, in, if you look at the mean difference, it will be about 10 point difference for male. Female, it will be about 40 point difference. And if we are looking at the, uh, the contribution to why they are uh, having the difference, the main contribution uh, is they compensate a lot in female. So with this, um, basically we know that uh, it is important for us to know neurodiversity is an important concept in the workplace. And we have this, um, we have built this, uh, a, a model called the strength-based model of neurodiversity. And this is uh, very different from disability model, which focus on the um, diagnosis. Strength-based model is really about what the person can do. There are a few components of, neuro, neuro, uh, of this strength-based model. Positive psychology, positive psychiatry. Uh, we talk about the theory of multiple intelligence, and there's also the seven factors of development. We want to consider neurodiverse conditions as conditions rather than disorder, and acknowledge challenges, because there are challenges, instead of calling them deficits. And we also want to apply the, uh, the strength-based approach across the entire spectrum of neurodiverse conditions. Positive psychology is a field that were, was um, introduced by Martin Sadman and Mihaly Chekse Mihaly, and they define the core of positive psychology as well-being, contentment, satisfaction. Flow is uh, immersing oneself in an activity and get satisfaction and happiness out of it as well as hope and optimism. The last 20 years, there are many published definitions. There are three major themes that come up top uh, on positive psychology. If you are to remember three words, it will be about strains, what, about fulfillment, and about growth or development. Positive psychiatry and positive, uh, in uh, contrast to traditional psychiatry, uh, is that um, positive psychiatry focuses on positive attributes and uh, strains and protective factors and neuroplasticity versus what's wrong and what is what are the risk factors. Traditional psychiatry is reactive in that it treats symptoms by medication and short-term psychotherapy. 
Positive psychiatry would use psychoeducational interventions to increase well-being and growth, and this can uh, last for a lifetime. And it also can reduce the symptoms emerging if we are doing it right. The seven factors of um, development is basically the developmental task that all the adolescents and young adults have to achieve in order to become a full adult. And you can um, uh, basically ask three questions when we look at all these uh, seven factors. Is that how can we help neurodiverse individuals achieve these developmental tasks? And then the second is how can the environment be shaped uh, so that neurodiverse individuals can get support to achieve these developmental tasks. And then the third is, what about the mental health providers? Instead of uh, uh, being reactive and treat symptoms, uh, can we actually help neurodiverse individuals develop better and grow better so that uh, we uh, will see uh, fruits uh, by having fewer symptoms? And when we are applying the strength-based model to neurodiverse in individuals, we would raise their awareness of personal strengths, increase their trust in personal ability, help them learn to engage in relationships, increase self-satisfaction through success. And this can move them away from the, um, the negativity and mobility such as anxiety, depression, and executive dysfunction. And with this strength-based model, we uh, created this Stanford Neurodiversity Project. It is a special initiative of the psychiatry department and is also uh, uh, in line with our presidential in initiative, Inclusion, diverse, Diversity, Equity and Access in the Learning Environment. We have several initiatives in the strength-based model. The first is a, a most important. It is about establishing a culture that treasures the strengths of neurodiverse individuals. We want to empower neurodiverse individuals to build their identity based on their strengths, and that can last for a lifetime. And we want to attract talented individual, neurodiverse individuals to come to Stanford to study and work. And we also partner with uh, many organizations uh, to help them um, recruit talented neurodiverse individuals to work there and uh, also train others to work with the neurodiverse population and we would uh, disseminate the model as widely as possible to maximize the potential of neurodiversity not only for the neurodiverse individuals but for all of us because they have so much to bring to the table. We have a um, large team that have been working tirelessly on this project and uh, we use a very uh, much a person-centered uh, approach to neurodiverse individual, but we are, it is also an ecosystem-driven approach. So the ecosystem would have uh, the family and friends, mentors, therapists. In the education setting, there are teachers, coaches, classmates, roommates in the immediate circle that can make the uh, learning environment more neurodiversity friendly. And the larger circle, the school officials and school community can uh, also make um, a difference by um, changing policies and making the larger environment more neurodiversity friendly. And in the same way, in the employment setting, the supervisors, job coaches, colleagues can make the immediate circle more neurodiversity friendly and the executives and the work community can contribute as well. We have three initiatives. Uh, neurodiversity awareness and education, neurodiversity at work and wellness, and neurodiversity independent living skills initiative. And embedded in the uh, initiatives are many different programs. And please feel free to visit our website to learn about the individual programs. But uh, I'm, I'm going to um, just focus on uh, the neurodiversity at work program which is basically a program that um, building a neurodiversity uh, friendly environment uh, by helping both employers and neurodiverse um, job seekers and employees. And uh, using a, um, a evidence-based approach, we've uh, dissect uh, what are the components that we can 
contribute to like social support, adaptive strategies, cognitive supports, employment support services, and vocational training support. This is an article that uh, came out in Stanford Medicine, um, basically our own uh, newspaper uh, that talk about one of our own um, in, uh, autistic individual who uh, got a job and actually got a promotion, did very well uh, in our Neuroscience Institute. And we also collaborate with Google. Uh, this is a uh, an article from Forbes and another article in uh, The Hill talking about the collaboration. And here are some other organizations that we have successfully um, placed people to, to work in there, including different departments at Stanford, as well as uh, uh, large organizations and smaller organizations and even um, state agencies. And uh, we have a candidate registry uh, that have over 500 um, autistic individuals at the moment that are very active. There are a few hundred that are less active. And uh, we uh, put them uh, into the matching pool. If they are ready, job ready, if they are not, then they would uh, go to uh, pre-employment training or internship and then come back to us. In parallel, we also have a job bank that uh, get um, the uh, companies that have their specialized program to put their jobs in here. And if they are not job ready, or I mean, if they are not neurodiversity, uh, friendly environment yet, then we'll train them so that they can make their environment uh, more neurodiversity friendly. And uh, as I mentioned, we support both neurodiverse individual and the employer. And um, we talk about helping them in the job search process as well as after the job search, after uh, they, they are on board, onboarded in their work, we help them in the 12 week period after they start work. And in parallel, employer, we provide awareness training and best practice uh, training uh, to build their uh, environment, a more neurodiversity environment for the neurodiverse individuals and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the group that's working with us. And after the uh, onboarding, the employer is also provided uh, a separate 12 week support training. So each person, um, each neurodiverse individual will be supported by two circle and there is a coach that support the workplace support circle. There is another coach that support the neurodiverse individual and the personal life support circle. And um, we have a uh, extensive uh, curriculum for the neurodiverse individual and also an extensive curriculum for the, um, uh, for the employer. Um, so just want to give a plug on uh, our Stanford Neurodiversity Summit on October 23rd to 25th. Uh, please consider coming to our website and uh, register. We have uh, some of the, uh, the most um, uh, influential uh, people um, that will be speaking, um, like an autistic doctor that founded Autistic Doctor in International, uh, there, there are several hundred individuals um, in that organization already. Autistic producer uh, and uh, non-speaking autistic um, self-advocate as well as poet and uh, very influential uh, person and many others. This is virtual, so um, it's also an easy way for you to uh, be um, participating. In summary, neurodiverse individuals have so much to offer to organizations if they are given a chance and they do have specific challenges, but they can be overcome. We built a strength based model of neurodiversity to um, uh, to formulate uh, the way that uh, we can build programs in the Stanford Neurodiversity Project. So with this, uh, I would like to um, to thank you for your attention and uh, I will be happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you Thank so you much, so Dr. much. Dr. Dr. Bob. Um, um, so we have 
a couple questions uh, as well as some comments that came up in the chat. Uh, and I see that there's already a hand up, but I will uh, first address the questions. So um, I think you touched upon this a little bit during your presentation is there has been reports. Uh, the question is there has been reports of some leaders such as Elon Musk and Bill, Bill Gates as being high as being on the high functioning autism part of the spectrum. Any comments of challenges of high of those in the high functioning uh, portion of the spectrum in leadership positions? So that's the first part of the question and then yeah. the second. So uh, generally speaking, uh, for high functioning um, uh, people on the autism spectrum, uh, they still have a, a lot of challenges in terms of depression and anxiety, the co-occurring, uh, um, the, the, those co uh, the prevalence for these co-occurrence is about 40%. Um, for anxiety actually should be even higher, uh, but uh, to actually have an anxiety disorder is 40%. So uh, it is um, it, imagining that uh, leaders have to really do so much um, like facing people and they have to really have a very strong way of uh, representation and um, and camouflaging most likely is going to be involved in a lot of these individuals uh, because they need to be showing that they are competent and they are very competent but uh, it is a, a lot of the time it takes a lot of energy to camouflage um, like the social interactions uh, that they may have, it may take them a lot of energy to be with uh, people, talking with a lot of people. Um, so, so kind of uh, on the surface, I would say that uh, high functioning people also have um, those those challenges that uh, people may not uh, easily recognize compared to the individuals that have more substantial needs. Thank you for that response. Um, so a follow up question um, to that is, can you comment on the prevalence of those on the high functioning part of the spectrum in uh, research and development organizations? That's a very good question. What, what we we don't have a precise number in terms of the prevalence, but what we can say is that there uh, is a study that's done uh, and was published in Nature Communications with it's a really pre, pre, uh, very uh, premier uh, journal in science and uh, it actually um, uh, talk about the graduate students in science and uh, the percentage of graduate students with um, with depression and anxiety is really high. It's uh, like 30% um, uh, also overall. And uh, the people that are uh, having uh, any social difficulties with their supervisors, which is very common for autistic individuals and neurodiverse individuals, they have even higher uh, depression and anxiety it can be uh, that group. I, I don't remember exactly the number. I think it is probably about 50%. So um, if you're thinking about the science community uh, that can be translated from like graduate school, um, this, the, uh, the, the training, uh, like the scientists in training, so to speak, um, and that will translate uh, for later. It is a very large percentage that we can predict, um, but we, I don't think we do have a firm number. Fair enough. Um, thank you for that response. Uh, the next question is, we ha I know we have five minutes left, um, so if we don't get to your question, um, sorry about that. Uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll find a workaround. OK, next question. Are autism and schizophrenia at the extremes of the human ability to focus? And if so, do they represent a condition of the higher conceptual functions of the human brain rather than the individual data processing functions of the human consciousness? I'm going to read that again because that's a lot. So the first part of that question is, are autism and schizophrenia at the extremes of the human ability to focus? First so part. if you're talking about focus, it, it is really about uh, executive function, 
uh, exactly functioning. And uh, people with ADHD would be having exactly function differences. And, um, and they can hyper focus on certain things that they are interested in, but they can also um, like not care about anything else that they are not interested in. But the autism population, a lot of the time they focus, they are really drawn to things that they are they're interested in to a uh, very deep level. So I would say that's a group that you can say that in terms of focusing on things, they have a deep interest and they can really like uh, drawn themselves to hyper focus for a long time. It's also a group. Schizophrenia, however, usually we don't think that there is such a uh, focus. They do have uh, exactly function differences, however. So I would say um, they, in terms of focusing, they may have uh, a different way of, um, or they in the in the spectrum of focusing on things. Um, they may still be like a, a subgroup that uh, will be on the edges of the bell shaped curve. Wonderful. Um, so I would address the comments that were made in the chat, but the same folks were um, had their hand up. So I will go to the participants. So first, James, you're up. What this is probably tied to the comment that I made to uh, Ms. Kim, Dr. Kim. Um, <laughs> Miss Kim, but okay. okay. If it's a comment towards me, and it, it but, we can talk about it I'll, later. But yeah, yeah, but it's but I think it's probably relevant to you as well. Is when you kind of emphasize the strengths of neurodiversity, how do you kind of balance that and try to be careful of you know not downplaying you know the dark sides? And I noticed in some of your signs you talked about you know actually having services for dealing with some of those downsides um so that that's helpful but kind of how do you be in the view of you know neurodiversity is i guess maybe the better way to, is with an analogy i mean take say a colorblind person they can see you know they may be able to see through camouflage better than someone who can see colors because of how camouflage is done but they're still colorblind and if you you, and if you kind of overemphasize the whole, oh, hey, they can see through the camouflage and kind of forget the other parts, you're you're going to ha have problems. So kind of how do you try to not, <clears throat> I'm trying to turn this less of a comp than a question, sort of like, how do you make sure that you address the downsides without getting <clears throat> so, without over pathologizing or getting in, you know, kind of want to not. Yeah, I think I think I know what you're like it, It's because it seems like if you're talking about someone who's neurodiverse, mm -hmm. it's can both a difference and in various contexts can be a pathology. Um, so yeah, so I get I, that question a lot. So uh, uh, I understand how how you are uh, coming with this question. So we, we it's important for, for us to uh, understand that neurodiversity, that the model, uh, the strength-based model of neurodiversity is a model. So it is a model for us to really build a, uh, a an environment that is neurodiversity friendly. And when we are talking about that model, we all already stated that we want to uh, not forget about the challenges, but we don't want to call them deficits. Because when they do have the challenges and those challenges are something that uh, really we have to help uh, ameliorate the problem, we will do that. And uh, But then uh, if we call them deficits, then it's going to be no way for them to be uh, spinning into streams. So basically, we can acknowledge that uh, some people maybe they have a little bit of trouble with, uh, say, uh, seeing the big picture, for example. Mm -hmm. 
um, but they are also very good at uh, details. So when you have an environment that is really supportive of that person to uh, use their ability to get deep into the details and solve problems, but uh, at the same time, when they are needing to actually see the big picture, have a support system to tell them that, oh, okay, maybe we also have to see the big picture and don't call it a deficit because it is just a natural tendency. If you, if we all have the same way of thinking about things, there is no advancement in science. I hope that answered your question. Sort of. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it can be a very long winded. I can talk about this for an hour. I'm not the reason sure that we I... decided to have a discussion about it the next day because we figured that it would generate yeah. these kinds of conversations. So thank you for that question. I did want to acknowledge that it is past the hour. So those of you who need to hop off to another meeting, uh, please do so. And thank you so much for your participation. Uh, those uh, who can stay on uh, will be staying on for maybe a, a couple more minutes to squeeze in one more question, if that's OK. Um, and I just and. Thank you all so much. Uh, th thank you for those who uh, participated and thank you uh, to Greg Ruark who uh, was able to uh, coordinate this event uh, for us. So thank you so much. OK, next question. Um, I think Nero, are you still on? Yes, I'm still on. OK. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, yeah, very uh, interesting and, uh, you know, for somebody like us on the science and uh, that side, we don't get to hear a presentation like this, so uh, thank you for that. My question was that, uh, you know, uh, is there a specific like a test or di how diagnosis for this kind of a condition or is it uh, really a, just a, a behavior based assessment of uh, whether somebody has autism or not or ADHD or not? Because I remember several years ago, there was a lot of things in the news where it said that, you know, hey, uh, uh, in US, uh, uh, people are over diagnosing uh, uh, the condition of ADHD in children and then putting them on medicine uh, that are that were very powerful and that has its own set of side effects and all that. So that's what I was thinking that, you know, is there like a large error bar on diagnosing somebody with autism or autism spectrum or ADHD or any other, you know, uh, uh, labels we used in this presentation. Yeah, so um, I, I think what we want to acknowledge is that uh, the, the neurodiverse conditions su such as uh, autism, if we are focusing on that it, itself, uh, autism is a very large spectrum. There are some people that have in no intellectual disability. In fact, they have superior intelligence. But there are also people with substantial needs and they sometimes have intellectual disabilities. So they can present in a very, very wide range. And in this uh, field of autism, there are many providers that can uh, provide diagnosis like psychiatrists like me and psychologists and neurologists, developmental pediatrician, and they all spend different amounts of time uh, working with the population. And so definitely there is going to be some variability in terms of how like how inclusive they are or how exclusive they are. So there is some error bar, so 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 to speak. And it is behavioral. We we don't have, although I do neuroimaging myself, we don't have a uh, objective tool to diagnose autism at the moment. We, uh, we, we still use behavioral uh, approach or the, using um, the current criteria that are all behavioral uh, based. Does that uh, answer your question? Yeah, it, it does. And it, it almost sounds like, you know, it, uh, for us in a workplace, it's really about uh, getting to know your people, their strength and, you know, as you said, not weaknesses, but challenges and assign them the work, uh, you know, uh, according to that, so that uh, at least the, from an uh, institution perspective, the important work gets done. That's uh, really the, my take home message, it seems. Yes, indeed. Thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you so much for your question and your response, um, Dr. Fong. So um, I I will have to now adjourn this event. I, there's a lot more questions. Uh, there are other questions uh, and comments in the chat. Dr. Fong, would you be OK with um, if we had some questions that come up in the chat, if we could just email them to you and maybe you could uh, do a quick response or is that too much? It, uh, I'll I'll see what I can do. It's a uh... It's a little bit challenging sometimes. Uh, I totally get it. And sorry to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, clearly this is a very interesting topic. Um, so I see that Greg is uh, has his video on. Did you want to say a couple comments, Greg? Uh, simply that it's um, noting what Tyler had mentioned in the discussion that there's a lot of things that was brought up today that we're hoping to have more conversation about tomorrow. So if your schedule affords it, please tune in. Um, special thanks to Dr. Fung. Thank you so much for coming and talking with us. Um, and um, it's been really helpful and has a lot of different thoughts swirling in my mind. Thank you. Most welcome and thank you for the invitations. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and um, we will end this uh, session. And again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fung, for making the time today. And if you are interested in talking more about this, please join us tomorrow, same time, uh, in the EEO diversity, um, EEO work, DEI EEO work uh, channel in the ARL Cafe. Okay, I will stop recording now. <laughs>